I'm Robert Bernardo, and it's my pleasure to serve as the co-chair of the San Mateo County Democrats Leadership Committee, and I'm also today's moderator and panelist as well, sort of multitasking today. Uh, today, we will focus on the topic of communications, and I will introduce our, fe our fellow guest speakers shortly. Uh, then I'm going to have them share their insights, and then at the end, we will open it up to questions. Um, and it's important to note that, you know, while the presentations you're about to hear are important, I also believe that most of the key learnings will come from the discussions in the Q&A. So really, we encourage your questions, okay? So um, be thinking of questions, and if you'd like, you can put them in the chat, and later on, we'll also taking them live taking questions live as well. So um, let's go ahead and start. And um, our first special guest panelist is Lenka Wright. And a little bit about Lenka. Lenka has had more than a decade of experience in public communications. She's led citywide communications and outreach for cities in California, including Santa Clara and San Jose, Bellevue, Washington, and Abilene, Texas. Lenka currently serves as the City of Mountain View's first Chief Communications Officer. Prior to her career in public service, Lenka was an award-winning news anchor reporter at TV stations in Florida, New York, and South Dakota, Texas, and Wyoming. It's a lot, it's a lot of states. Wow, very impressive. Lenka holds a bachelor's degree in telecommunications and political science from Indiana University and a master's degree with distinction in communication arts from New York Institute of Technology. She is a certified public manager through Texas State University San Marcos. Lenka has also earned certifications in public information through the California Association of Public Information Officials and in crisis communications, reputation management, reputation risk management, and digital communications through the Public Relations Society of America. Lenka is a military spouse and proud mom of an incoming high school sophomore. She resides in South San Jose, where she's civically engaged and building community one person at a time. Most recently, Lenka was a candidate for San Jose City Council District 10. So why don't we start with um, Lenka, in her presentation, she'll give a little, she'll share her insights, and then we'll move on to the next panelist. So Lenka, you have the floor. Great, thanks so much, Robert, for having me here. And thanks everyone for taking some time out of your busy schedules to join us for this important training for you. Well, as you just heard, I've been involved in the art of messaging and storytelling for decades. However, doing so in the political arena as a candidate was new for me. Now, I experienced different types of challenges, like how to stay on message during a candidate forum, no matter the question asked. And let me tell you, there were some doozies. Uh, I also learned on the fly when a voter or two didn't want to hear anything beyond which political party I'm affiliated with. And this was in a nonpartisan race. Well, today I'm here to share with you my insights and some lessons learned from the campaign trail when it comes to messaging. And this is one of the few things that you have under your control. Now, I cannot overemphasize that mixed messaging and poor communications could quickly put an end to your political aspirations. So let's first start with the nomenclature. What's meant by political campaign messaging? It's simply the mechanism in which you attract voters towards your campaign and who will ultimately come out on election day and vote for you. With that said, here are my top five tips for political campaign messaging. Number one, be true to who you are. Essentially, remain authentic to who you are and what you represent. Know your values. Understand why you're running and what do you aim to accomplish when elected. If you know this before you officially announce your intentions, you will have a much better path for staying on message. Number two, 
Learn what your voters care about. Do your homework and find out what issues are top of mind for your voters. Get to know your audience. I'm talking about the voters. Not only do you need to know their concerns, but the voters expect you to come ready with solutions. Knowing these issues and how you aim to solve them will contribute to how you develop your campaign messaging and being successful in reaching the mindset of the general audience. Number three, identify what makes you the best choice at the ballot box. Whether you're a policy wonk, a community organizer, or a concerned parent who's been heavily involved in their child's education, determine what makes you stand out and be the best choice for voters. Now, don't forget uh, to consider your shortcomings. Yep, we all have them. And how they can be turned into a positive or perhaps shed light on an issue in your community. Your messaging should emphasize the qualities that make you unique and the best option for the elected role. Number four, practice. I'm gonna spend a little more time on tip number four because if there's the one time you need to be prepared, this is it, when you're running for office and be ready to practice and practice and practice some more. You may have the best talking points and slogan, but if you can't remember them or respond to random questions, all that time and energy are for naught. Anticipate the questions you may be asked, whether it's when you're out in the field door knocking or being interviewed by a reporter. Consider how you're going to respond to the question. What's your go-to response when asked about a hot button or perhaps controversial issues? I recommend practicing Q&A with a trusted member of your campaign or a politically savvy, savvy friend. You want to practice with someone who will not only be honest with you, but also understands the political landscape. Depending on what you're asked, you may answer it directly or redirect it to your talking points and what you want to get across. Believe me, I've interviewed dozens of elected officials during my TV news days, and the ones who are successfully politically tend to be very good at talking about what they wanted to talk about without being noxious about it. Now, let me give you some examples of how you can redirect by using transitional phrases. They're ones like, you know, that's an interesting question. It reminds me of this going on in my community, or let me put that in perspective. So in addition, have stories ready that demonstrate your values and how you will be an effective lawmaker when elected. Number five, elicit emotion with your campaign messaging. Now, when it comes to your campaign, consider how do you want the audience, the voters to feel? Do you want them to connect you with hope, unity, or perhaps relief? Your personal brand will shape their perceptions and influence their decision-making process at the polls. When they get your mailer or receive a text message from you, the message should be clear and compelling. The message should reflect your core values and principles. Depending on the communication channel, it should also highlight your beliefs on key issues. The message may change depending on the, on the audience. However, the golden rule is to craft messages that connect with voters emotionally while remaining authentic and sincere to who you are. And those are my top five tips for political campaign messaging. Now, I'm going to share a little a short story with you about the challenges in developing messaging concerns coming up with a campaign slogan. Now, for those of you who have run before, you know what I'm talking about. Now, the slogan is supposed to summarize what your campaign is all about. Slogans that incorporate an emotional touch have made some political campaigns stand out from others, such as President Obama's memorable, Yes, We Can. I checked the boxes on the elements for developing my campaign messages from what I wanted to accomplish and running for office to knowing my values. Even so, how to communicate that in an easy to remember phrase that represented my campaign was tough. As a communicator professionally, I felt the pressure. I think my team and I went back and forth on ideas for three weeks or so. I would do unofficial polls on slogans with trusted allies. I think I came up with a good one, only to be told that's too long or 
wouldn't fit on a yard sign. They range from ones like leader for our future to phrases like practical, refreshing, transparent. When we finally landed on one, it felt right and on message. Now, even now, months after the campaign came to an end, you know, I still receive positive feedback on the slogan of standing up for our future. And that slogan remains representative of what I'm still doing today as a former candidate who remains an engaged resident committed to moving our community forward. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Robert. Thank you so much, Lenka. That was incredible. Lots of very important uh, pieces of information in there. And thank you for sharing your insights and your personal story. Um, a wealth of information there. Uh, I will go next. Uh, we have another panelist and um, he should be coming along shortly, but I will go next. Uh, before I do my presentation, just a little bit about myself. Um, I am a former two-term countywide elected official in San Mateo County, where I've resided for over 50 years. I live in South San Francisco, and I'm proud to have been the first openly gay Jewish Filipino American to be elected countywide back in 2010, where we received over 73,000 votes across 20 cities and 18 towns, including all the unincorporated areas. Uh, in that first uh, race, I was able to come in first place in a field of four candidates, um, beating out the incumbent. Uh, I was reelected in 2014, and in my day job, I'm the director of communications and chief spokesperson for the Port of Oakland, which also owns and operates OAK Airport and Jack London Square. Prior to the port, I worked in law enforcement as a detective for the San Francisco District Attorney's Office. At the time, I was one of only a handful of openly gay detectives of color in the unit. Uh, I graduated from the University of California at Davis with a degree in English, and I'm a huge Swifty. I love Taylor Swift. So with that, I am going to begin my presentation. Uh, I'm going to share screen here. Okay, so most folks, when they think of the media, they think one of two ways. One, the media will do whatever they want. They have total control, um, and um, I'm just a pawn in the media game. And then the other philosophy, I flip this around, is that I have some control over how the media covers my story. So... My philosophy is that I will allow the press to hear, to see what I want them to see, to hear what I want them to hear, and to write what I want them to write. So it's a very bold and assertive view of how I want to take control of the media message. And there's a lot of ways to do this, which I'll go into shortly. I have about nine slides here, so hopefully I'll just kind of zoom through this to allow more time for discussion and Q&A. So I want to back up and just talk about the elements of communication. Uh, back in 1967, a UCLA professor, uh, Albert Morabian, came up with the components of communication. And it's very interesting that much of communication is visual. It's what you see. And, and that translates into, you know, if the person is talking to you, are they doing something distracting? Is there something that is hindering that communication visually. Vocal is the sound, okay? Which is another very big component in communication. Uh, the actual words or content, sadly, is only 7% of the equation. So keep that in mind when we talk about communicating, okay? And a lot of this translates, I mean, it's really hard to, to discuss this via Zoom because it's such a flat media or medium, uh, but, the when you're campaigning in person, when you're out in the streets, when you're on a stage, it's very different. People will see you, they'll hear you. It's a very different feeling. So moving right along. Body language and attire. So just a few tips, maintain good eye contact. It's very important. That's how you connect to your audience. Posture is important. If you're slouching, that 
communicates something. It communicates that maybe this person isn't quite uh, quite solid as a human being that I want them to be. No distracting attire, patterns, jewelry, things. Again, anything that would take away from what you're saying. Uh, in terms of attire, if you're going to be on TV or a camera, the best are solids and pastels, like any shade of blue, for example, always looks good on TV. Speak slowly, speak slower than normal, and I always try to use 10 words or less per sentence. Project energy and confidence. And as uh, Lenka said earlier, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And if you have to record yourself, if you have to practice in front of friends or family, do it, but rehearse, okay? The most important thing in communicating as a politician, if you don't tell your story, your opponent will. And I tell you, they will. They did with me. Uh, they, they tried to. Uh, they didn't quite succeed the first time around. The second time around, they, they did a much better of trying to say what a horrible person I am, uh, especially when they bought full page ads against me. Um, and that was that was really unnerving, especially in, in one's reelection. But but the most important thing to remember, again, is you tell your story, you tell the voters who you are. Otherwise, the haters are really going to take over social media and ads and they're going to paint a very, very horrible picture of you. And you don't want that to happen. OK, moving right along. So what does that mean? It means be the first to deliver your message. Get out the gate fast. Tell the people who you are first and what your values are. And keep your messages simple. I always, in my line of work every day, I speak in eighth grade language. I avoid college level or professorial words because people will, you'll get, they'll get lost. Deliver your message effectively. I talked out about that earlier in terms of body language, eye contact, and speech. And help the public understand what you're saying by using infographics, charts, images. Um, images are so important. Uh, you've heard the, the saying that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, and it's very true, especially on social media when we live in a meme world. Everything is memes these days. So that's how people communicate now. Moving right along. Formulate two to three key messages, <laughs> no, no more than three, because if you have more than three, uh, people get lost and they get confused. Be specific. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? Well, examples, balanced budget, people get that. School funding, people get that. Environmental sustainability, People understand that. Very simple, very specific. Try to keep it to two words. Again, keep it simple. I keep saying that over and over again. Be a good short storyteller. Tell your story within a minute or a minute and a half, or be able to do that. And then finally, on the last slide, just some, some important communication tips for politicians. Memorize your key issues, your website. Always be sure to give your website because you're asking for money, right? So make sure you have your website. If you're asked about your platform, be ready. Be ready to go into them and go deep into what you believe in and how are you going to solve today's problems. Never pause or hesitate. I know that's hard. Sometimes you have to think. You have to take time to compose what you're thinking about. but Think of how that looks visually when you're looking up and you could possibly come across as aloof. Never say no comment. Never appear detached or evasive. And if you say no comment, you look evasive. It looks like you're trying to hide something. And remember that voters love friendly, warm, and open people. I just found the exact amount for Gina's. I don't know what yours is, but hers was 2000 I'm sorry, what was that? <laughs> um, I think that is it for the uh, presentation. Um, I think we're ready on, to move on to the question and answer, right? All right, um, let's look at the chat. Are there any questions in the chat? Let's see, no.
Okay, are there any questions? Robert, while we're waiting for some questions, I thought it was really interesting what you talked about with telling your story, because if you don't, your opponent will. And uh, I can say, yes, I have experienced that as well. And especially when you're not in the room, what are they saying about you? And how do you counter that with your messaging? Very true. Very true. And we've seen the ugliness, uh, to your point, Lenka, we've seen the ugliness in campaigns, especially it feels like, I don't know, as I get older, I'm 56 years old, it seems like it just gets uglier and uglier. And I, I honestly don't think I'd be able to campaign in 2024. It's so tough. I really, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying this to scare people. It's just, it will, it will show, I mean, it really will require a lot of strength in terms of just your your tenacity and your ability to shake off all the negativity that will come your way because that's just how politics is right um i so think that's something also we're definitely seeing in social media as somebody who recently experienced going through a campaign and i mean you see my name lenka right there was somebody on social media saying right is wrong uh just gonna <laughs> And, but at the same time, um, and this is, I'd be interested in your perspective on this, is that uh, you need your champions, you need those who believe in you to be helping share your story, as opposed to you or your campaign getting on social media and rebutting what they're saying. Yes, exactly. And great point. And Lenka, I'm glad you brought that up because that is such an uh, an effective tactic that you just raised where you have to ask yourself do you the candidate be the hatchet person to to be the deliverer of bad news and just negativity or do you have your allies and your your supporters do that for you you know that that is a tactic that does work and you know in presidential politics that's what a good vice president does the vice president is usually the attack dog. So uh, in my, uh, just personally, in my case, when, when I was being attacked, I decided, you know what, I'm going to actually speak up and I'm going to brand my opponent. And I branded them by one, not mentioning their name. I never mentioned the name of my opponent, so you never knew who they were. All I would say is that this person was a walking lawsuit and that became their name throughout the, the campaign. Mm -hmm. They were known as the walking lawsuit who cost the county millions of dollars of tax dollars, and that stuck. So, you know, that's effective. You know, if you're gonna hit back, sometimes you're gonna have to hit back. Uh, again, every campaign is different. You can't, yes. no two campaigns are the same, but um, to Lenka's point, having an attack dog or having someone who can be sort of the person out in front of you, almost as your spokesperson to deliver some of these um, counterpoints is very effective. So thank you, Linka. Yeah, they're Robert, welcome I see in. in the, I'm sorry, sorry, I see in the chat that there's a couple of questions now coming up. One from William Fong. He asks about initiating endorsements and fundraising. Is there sort of a communications piece to that that you might be able to help uh, William with? Linka, would you like to go first? Fundraising sure. and endorsements. Yeah, you know, that is interesting because I think with part of it is when you're seeking endorsements and some of those parties will be coming to you as well is, again, knowing what your values are, knowing what your main initiatives are that you want to accomplish with going to office and how do you sell those to those you're seeking endorsements as well as as part of your fundraising efforts, who are going to be the individual you're going to target to be able to help support and endorse your campaign. Robert? Thank you. Thank you, Lenka. From a communications perspective, ask yourself, what are the tools that are available to you? I, for fundraising and endorsements, obviously, th there's a lot of tools like email, phone calls, but they're very different in terms of how you should use them. For example, if you're asking for endorsements, you absolutely have to do it, in my opinion, in person, because nothing beats the personal touch. I, I never want someone to email me and say, hey, Robert, I need your endorsement. I mean, that is the most 
offensive <laughs> way to do it. If you're going to email someone just randomly and I mean, I guess if you, it depends on your relationship, if you know them really well, but the, my golden rule for, for uh, endorsements and fundraising is to do it personally. I would, I would do it over coffee. I will call them on the phone and say, hi, do you have a minute? Do you have five minutes? Um, I'm really trying to raise $10,000, whatever you can give me, you know, that type of thing. But Personal touch is everything. And that can be the difference between $100 or $1,000 for fundraising. So just remember, personal touch, that would be my, my communication strategy. Yeah, and I second that, Robert, because as someone who's new to the political world, uh, even though I knew a lot of electeds through and also their staff through the work that I do for cities, that uh, it was those personal meetings and for them to get to know me as a potential colleague as well. So I think it's very critical to not just shoot off an email or have someone introduce you who is someone that they know know that can essentially vouch for who you are. Thank you. That was excellent. Excellent. Uh, there's a question here that says, um, what's the best way to handle negative information from your past? Do you hope it's not found? Do you bring it up preemptively? For example, an affair or drug use? This is a great question, by the way. Lenka, would you like to go first? Yeah, the, you know, and this is something I do want to think a little about uh, because I think it's uh, whenever you're starting a campaign, uh, hopefully you do it before uh, you officially announce, but look at what would uh, do your own physician research on yourself and see what may come up and be ready to counter it. And I'll have to say, which I'm sure you're all going to not be thrilled with my answer, but it depends. It depends on the situation. It depends if you want to be, uh, you know, tackle it at the get-go, depending on what it is. And, uh, you know, it, but if it does come out though, you should be ready and prepared as to how are you going to respond? Because sometimes, and I'm sure Robert has experienced this and hi, Alex, good to see you. Uh, is that, uh, you may think with a media interview, you're going to be talking about X, Y, Z, and then all of a sudden they leave it for that last question that zinger comes at you. And so that's why you should be prepared that even though you think, oh, this will never come up, you know, it might not this time around, but I would say be prepared for it. Robert. Thank you. So I'm going to, um, answer that question as well. And then we'll have our next special guest speaker, Alex Melendrez, uh, go next. So back to the question, you know, it, it's really, this one hits me hard because I remember when I first ran in 2010, all of my friends said, you know what, you're going to lose because you've got three big things against you. You're Filipino American, you know, with all due respect, there aren't really a lot of Filipino. This was in 2010, okay? There aren't a lot of Filipino Americans. You're going to have to get the non-Filipinos to vote for you. Then they said, you live in South San Francisco, which is the capital of Catholicism, and you're Jewish. Forget that. You're, ne you're never going to get that vote. And then the third thing is, you're openly gay. Oh, my God. You just, you're going to have to work three times harder to try to win this election. So I had all of these things competing. And then I had people saying, oh, and you know, because you're gay, they're gonna, they're gonna try to equate you with, you know, all these online gay things. And I said, okay, look, here's the bottom line. I am not hiding who I am. Okay. I am gay, Jewish, and Filipino. Duh. I mean, look at me. Um, so I I sort of took the opposite approach. I was not gonna hide anything. I'm like, look, if you wanna talk to me about any of these things, these things, I'm happy to talk to you about it. My mother was Jewish. If you want to talk about that, I came out at age 16 and back in 1984, when it was really hard to come out. I'm happy to talk about these things, but really I want to talk about the other issues. I want to talk about um, good government. I want to talk about the environment. I want to talk about uh, fiscal policy. You know, those are the things I, I focused on, but yeah, you know, I, 
one tact is to try to hide from those things, which I guess you could, but why? Be authentic, be yourself, be proud. Um, that I mean, that's just my own personal feeling because at the end of the day, you, you have to, you're going to have to live with yourself and who you are. And so better better that the, the voters see that because they'll appreciate that more. Your honesty, they do appreciate that. So um, I will end with that. And now I would like to introduce our next speaker. Um, and uh, welcome, Alex. Alex is an elected member of the San Mateo County Democratic Party. He sits on the California Democratic Party's Legislative Committee and is a congressional DNC representative. He's also served as the communications director of the San Mateo County Democrats. Alex's day job is equity manager at Yimby Action, where he helps build housing justice coalitions and uplift the diversity of the housing movement. He began working in pro-housing advocacy in 2018 as an organizer for the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. As an organizer, Alex advocates for housing rights for communities in San Mateo County. He also endorses projects and policies that improve tenants' rights and housing affordability and mentoring the next generation of housing leaders. Alex is half Mexican, half Afghan, and proud of it. I love that. So, Alex, you have the floor. Please share with us your insights and ideas about communications and how to, to speak the language in terms of politics. Hello, everybody. Uh, first off, I'm going to apologize for being late. I am in New Orleans, totally different time zone. Um, and I'm actually kind of close to Bourbon Street, so I apologize for any uh, background noise. Um, but yeah, thank you so much uh, for letting me be here. Um, what I'm going to talk about really as far as communications is uh, a lot of what I heard just coming in is involving like how you're perceived, your identity. Um, and I really wanted to like double tap on that and a level of authenticity. One of the things that I actually said recently, and I'll get into like my core messaging in a sec, was this was in terms of coalition building, but it actually refers to how you reach out to voters and how you kind of like meet the moment or meet critical or difficult moments. Appeasement is the weakest form of coalition building. I think that, not I think, I know that applies to how you present yourself in a public forum. Um, so you're selling, you're basically selling a product or a mission or a vision, um, and that's you. Um, when you start to deviate from who you are at like a core message, you start to become an appeaser for your critics. Um, that really doesn't work for who your core audience is or who your core base is. Now, let me get to my main message. My theory of communication has always been rooted in being an organizer. Um, one, you wanna be authentic. Two, you wanna be able to keep your um, solutions and vision um, as simple as possible. If you have an idea that's unique, if you have something that hasn't been tried before, if you have some sort of conflicts policy that you know that works, you wanna be able to sell that with the outcome. You sell the outcome. When I was a communications manager for the, Cal uh, for the San Mateo County Democratic Party, one of the main things that I wanted to see was a better connection with common everyday Democrats. Part of that is um, showing the things you've worked on, showing the efforts that you're putting forward. One of the things that I really spotlighted was our existing work with uh, the Farm Worker Affairs Coalition. Um, basically I'm taking what the end result is, um, and advocating that as something we're working on. If somebody has questions, if somebody wants to know more, you don't have to dive into that. You don't have to be a policy nerd. Um, you can have that in your back pocket, but people will inherently come to you with questions. If they don't believe in your vision in the first place, uh, and they're skeptical, they're basically, they will uh, either stay like that or ask more questions. Um, as far as like my personal run as a candidate and my personal experience being in uh, a form of you know politics myself, authenticity is really the number one case. I don't hide the fact that I'm a regular human. I don't fight, hide the fact that I actually just you know I'm in New Orleans and I was running late and it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, the main way you connect with people is not by talking at them. Even right now, I know that I'm talking at you rather than trying to evoke a particular emotion. The highest form of communication for me is always trying to get somebody to uh, connect with you, either in relation to a story, you know all your own personal stories, um, your 
uh, your own story or somebody else's story that you've seen, experienced, or somebody you know. That gets somebody to connect with you at a deeper level, and it means you'll be able to communicate any of your messages, any of your policy ideas, and selling yourself in a public forum in a more authentic manner. Um, and sometimes it's uh, admitting that you make like mistakes. Sometimes it's um, you know telling the truth, like you know I haven't really thought about this particular solution enough. Um, let me get back to you. I need to think of this more. Um, so selling authenticity, kind of having like an organizing uh, organizer mindset, um, and communicating your outcome and your vision uh, is the most important. It doesn't matter if you're running as a candidate. It doesn't matter if you're running a campaign for a um, uh, uh, a particular like policy solution or proposition. Authenticity, selling your message. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, now we will uh, go back to the questions. Let's see. I'm um, going to try to go in order here in the chat. It says here, the Secretary of State encourages candidates to sign a code of fair campaign practices, elections code 20440, which forbids negative campaigning. How often do local candidates sign this and follow this? So panelists, um, I, this is kind of new to me. <laughs> it's been a while since I ran. So um, Lenka, Alex? Yeah, this did not come up in my race, uh, but I am very interested about it because I think that would help with the political discourse and perhaps with the apathy that we're seeing among voters uh, who are turned off by the attack ads and things of that nature. So I actually worked in the county elections office <laughs> briefly before I got more deeply involved in um, like actual po politics, because you can't be involved too heavily in politics if you work in an elections office. Um, and both that experience and the experience that I've had in like the last six years and being engaged in the local political and county political process, um, I want to say it varies. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't even remember if I signed this. I was running in a Democratic Central Committee race. So, you know, it depends. I'm just, I'm completely honest. However, I've seen enough political races where it was used as something to um, uh, basically uh, use as a sort of talking point for how the race is going. Um, you have to be kind of aware whether or not your fellow candidates are going to sign that. If you're signing that, um, it's a very like calculating uh, thing. There are going to be some cases where the general public uh, doesn't actually take observation to that. And there are going to be some instances where it does. So it's really up to you. I honestly just say lean to where your values are. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, I think I did sign that because at least for me, I try to run a very uh, positive, uh, restorative vision kind of um, public image, not just for myself, but the campaigns that I try to run. Um, if there's something that really upsets you um, and you think that's going to be in conflict with you, that's honestly a personal decision, but you have to be aware of the optics that that could possibly pay. You never know when a local journalist will pick it up. You never know when an op-ed is going to mention that somewhere. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. Thank you. Yeah, and I really have nothing to add because like I said, when I ran- I'm into sorry, I forgot one thing. Sure, please go yeah. ahead. It is one of the public documents that people can access in the county elections office. Very good point. That's an excellent point. Um, and I'm just going to piggyback off that real quick, what Alex said. Uh, a lot of what you sign, a lot of what you put out there, um, not only is it going to be in the internet, uh, it will be in places like the FPPC, which you know is sort of the keeper of all your uh, official campaign documents, which is open to the public. Everyone can pour through your campaign finances, everything about you. So that's a really good point. Um, let's see. The next question is, there is a cabal of people in my community, unfortunately, fellow Dems, who are not supporting me because I don't, I didn't support a recall back in 2020. I didn't support it due to fiscal reasons, but this continues to pop up. How do I address this? It's a really good question. Uh, Lenka, Alex, what advice would, would we give this person? 
I would say that if it comes up during a candidate forum, you can be very succinct as to why you didn't support it and then redirect to what you want to talk about. They're like, you know, here are the current issues. Let's let's take a closer look at this. So that way you're addressing it, but you're doing it so in a very succinct manner that you can then move on to what is important to your voters right now. I'm not sure if this was said earlier, and this was one of the core messages that I was trying to get out, um, but I forgot to mention. If I had my notes in front of me, I would remember. Um, but in, uh, when you're running a particular race or when you're in the political field, um, there's kind of two different worlds you kind of live in. You live in your um, uh, more public, normal person um, persona and what the general voters and general public are going to see and your local community members. And then there's a bit of an insider world. This is a world where you have to navigate endorsements. This is a world where you have to navigate fundraising. This is a world where you do have to uh, be involved in press. In local races and county level races and down, um, there's a level of information that the general public is just not going to be amenable to. That ties to this because, sorry, not amenable to, um, pay attention to. Um, when it comes to something like this, you can mitigate that. I'm such an organizer. You can mitigate a lot of that by pivoting to what you really want to talk about. And as you know, Linka just mentioned, and spending more of your energy on recruiting people, knocking on doors and doing a lot more uh, grassroots efforts. Uh, in your communication style, you really have to keep these two worlds because one can balance out the other. Um, if you don't feel like you're doing well enough in a public space uh, and you haven't reached enough voters, maybe you need more fundraising to run uh, uh, to get more uh, mailers out. Um, if you feel like you're you know, under scrutiny from uh, some local Democrats within your own field, um, do your best to mitigate that. Give your honest truth, that you, as uh, Lenka just mentioned, and go out there and hit the pavement. Um, but th those are the two different communication buckets that I would um, mention. And I just um, thank you. Thank you both, Lenka and Alex. Uh, I just like to add to this a um, couple a couple of things just that are on my mind with this question about fellow Dems. Um, just remember, you're never going to get everyone's approval. OK, that that's impossible. So you just want to try to. Uh, speak your truth, and then also try to broaden your, your base. You know, um, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't appeal to fellow Democrats, but there, but it's a big world out there. And um, I just remember in my first race, I didn't get endorsed by a local newspaper and it crushed me. Well, you know what? I look back and I'm like, I know how heartbroken I was, but at the end of the day, did it really affect my campaign? No, we still won even without that newspaper endorsement. And they did endorse me the second time around. But my point is, it may really hurt, but there is a world out there that, that supports you and you just have to reach out to those people. Okay, um, let's see, moving right along. I, I see there is a formula, there's a formula hit pieces about 10 days before the election. Um, what do we have to say about this? Hit pieces before the election. I'll say, I'll say don't get caught tearing down any signs. Yes. <laughs> like, definitely do not oh, do yes. that. Do not do that. Yes. Yeah, I think we've all had the experience of uh, our signs just disappearing. And uh, yep. <laughs> Don't stoop low. Voters notice. Yes, very true. Very true. They do. They really do. Um, we have to give we have to give voters credit. They 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 know what's going on. Uh, next one is to all three presenters. What is the solution to the unhoused challenge that's affecting all communities at this time? This one's kind of uh, my day job <laughs> and the issue that I think I've run on um, or talked about the most. I'm not going to tell you what your particular community. Um, well, I'm not going to tell you what you need to say to win your political race in a more. And that's a very Machiavellian answer, but that's going to be the truth of it. Um, in, in I'm trying to like pit, I'm trying to like put this in a communications bucket. The best way that you can kind of talk about this issue 
rather than me telling you what the solution is, because we can have a policy discussion on what the solution is, is to root it in compassion and stories. Um, stats, facts, and figures, um, or the observations of what people see, well, okay, stats, facts, and figures have their place, um, but we're, what you're really dealing with is what people see in their daily lives or their personal experiences. You can, um, how many times have you seen on Nextdoor where somebody complains about the local panhandler at Walgreens or CVS or something like that? That's somebody's personal perception because they've never experienced or seen somebody who's had housing insecurity in some sort of way. So you want to be able to talk about it in forms of compassion. You want to be able to give uh, people a different perspective. Um, your job really in this particular case, as in all cases, is not to um, convince somebody because the angry people will never be fully convinced. It's to recruit more people. Um, and you do that by being compassionate in some sort of way. Um, give a personal story about somebody you knew who was an unhoused teacher sleeping in their car. Um, my general piece of advice on this, if you're running a political race, is break the norm. Say something about somebody who isn't your stereo stereotypical, visible, unhoused individual. Um, that'll be able to uh, provide you more leeway to sell your message. More dollars, navigation housing, um, you know, whatever voucher program you want to be able to uh, advocate for. Rooted in compassion and personalization. People don't uh, attach to numbers. They attach to personal stories, stories and feelings. And I concur with what Alex said as far as with telling stories and also do some listening as well. I think that's something that uh, the community appreciates when you're listening to what they're experiencing. And with all of our communities, you know, there are different hot button issues when it comes to how to address the homelessness situation. You know, it is pervasive and uh, you know, you're seeing more of an effort with the regional approach, but again, it goes back to storytelling and how will you relate to what people are experiencing and how do your policy solutions fit into what you're running on in your particular race? Thank you. Alex, did you have anything to add to that? I did. So quick policy answer. Um, there's a massive housing shortage, and that causes a bunch of downward pressure. For every one job there is, there, for every um, 12 jobs, there's only one unit of housing. That's my policy answer as somebody who's been working on this for um, eight years. Um, but aside from that, and this can apply to any issue that you think is um, 12 jobs, one home. Thank you. Uh, this applies to any hot button issue that you think can cause contention or cause like the really like small minority of people to be really loud talking about NIMBYs, but this applies anywhere is um, this is an old sales tactic. My mom told me that has worked for me in my entire political career. Feel felt found. You listen to somebody's complaint and you give an answer that's in a format of, you know, this is how, you know, feel felt found. I, I feel you. Um, I felt that this is what I found. And you can take that in three different lines and draw those out in your answer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm learning a lot from this myself. This is such, such a wealth of information here. Um, next question. During a candidate forum, when you were asked a question about a topic that you were not familiar with, how did you handle it? Who'd like to go first? So I've I'll actually been. Oh, go oh, ahead, go Alex. Ahead. No, no, no. Go, go. <laughs> I was, I was actually going to say I've never been a, in a debate myself, but I've been a moderator for several. <laughs> and the most successful candidates that I've seen, I think I've already answered this earlier, are honest about their what they know. And the number one answer that you can give, regardless of where your like preconceived um, answers are. Uh, is like, I would really love to learn more. Approaching it with an open mind is better than um, anything else. It gives you the most leeway when you want to say or you honestly feel like you don't know. Um, giving guesses is very risky. Um, sometimes it can appeal to some voters, but you're really rolling the dice with that. So um, tell somebody you want to learn more. 
And Thank I you. second what Alex is saying as far as with, uh, yeah, same, you know, I want to learn more. That's not an area I'm familiar with, but would like to chat with you some more after the forum to learn some more. And sometimes, too, you may be asked questions that have nothing to do with your race at all. It could be a federal issue. It could be a state issue. It could be an issue another community is dealing with. And so with something like that, you can say, if you do know this, that, oh, well, that's a county issue, but here's uh, how it might affect us here. And uh, so that's another way that you could answer those sort of questions that uh, you don't know the answer to. But again, be honest about it. Thank you. There's a there's a comment here about voter guides. You know, we were talking earlier about uh, mailers, and now there's a question about voter guides and things like that. So. Um, Lenka and Alex, do you want to share uh, your insights about mailers in general and communicating using mailers and voter guides and how effective those are or, or not, not effective? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'll start the conversation with uh, you have to do uh, utilize as many communication channels as you can. Uh, we're seeing that social media is now with digital ads. That is another way that uh, you're reaching voters where they are. Uh, text messaging also uh, is on the rise too as a way to get someone's attention. Although I know that uh, you know, from just talking anecdotally to voters that some of them are getting frustrated with the number of text messages they're receiving. Uh, in communications in general, mailers are often the most effective way. It's also expensive as well. Uh, but for your information to get into hands of folks from in their mailbox. If you have the budget, I mean, uh, ads on TV, cable, uh, those are another way to reach folks. Uh, but you have to use all the communication channels that your campaign is able to afford because you know, people have such limited attention spans. So, uh, I'll just kind of leave it at that because I'm interested to also hear from Alex as well as you, Robert, with your experience and how things have evolved over the years. Because I really think uh, social media campaigning has uh, really broadened in you know, the last couple of years. Thank you, Lenka. Alex, would you like to go next? Yes, um, I can't think of a more uh, divisive, not divisive, I can't think of a, uh, a, a question that has uh, more differences of opinions between a candidate and this one. <laughs> um, despite being uh, one of the more uh, youngish candidates um, and uh, a younger person in politics, um, I think the answer is still primarily uh, mailers first is most effective. Um, I actually won my campaign by hair, uh, mostly through mailers, not digital ads. Um, we did have some digital ads. Um, it kind of varies. I do want to. I do want to tie it in. Sorry, there was a car going by. I do want to tie it into like the overall theme of some of the answers that I gave. Is you have to know your audience. Your audience is not always going to be the same in every single instance. Your digital media audience is not going to be the exact same thing as your uh, mailer audience. It's definitely not going to be the same as your uh, debate audience. Um, and it's definitely not going to be the same as the audience that you uh, are probably having to deal with on Nextdoor. Um, it's really, as Linka said, an all above approach. Uh, social media is gaining in um, um, importance. It's not so much like uh, putting out a message and hoping somebody shares it several times. Uh, you have to do paid social media. You have to do paid social media and you have to do it wide. If I'm being honest, Facebook and Instagram, um, although they are kind of falling out of favor compared to things like uh, usage for, as far as like TikTok and you know maybe threads or Twitter still has a bit of uh, a following in it. The, the math and the ad dollars are still there as most effective for Facebook and Instagram. Facebook is how you get uh, and pay for ads through Instagram. That being said, 
Um, mailers are still king. Mailers are how I won my, uh, I won my race. They uh, get to somebody's home. Digital ads uh, feed somebody's individual short attention span. Um, that sounds a little rude, but it, that's kind of what social media is designed to do in this day and age. You really have to hit somebody more than a couple of times. The old adage is somebody doesn't usually remember something until they see it three times. If I'm being honest, I think that's actually higher with social media. But with mailers, that rule definitely applies. And Alex, I'll share that when my first mailer dropped, when I was going door knocking right away, that was like, whoa, you just get your I just got your mailer. Oh, that's you. And so, and I yeah. never heard that about anything on social media. So uh, I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> I had the same thing. I noticed the difference when I was making calls after my first mailer dropped. Thank you. Uh, yes. So uh, we have, actually it's 1230. So, you know, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us today.